Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Beneath the Surface, Exploring Underground Stormwater Detention Material Options. Before we begin today's presentation, we would like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All of the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. Helpful resources are bookmarked in the related content tool. Our webinar today is scheduled to last for one hour and will include a question and answer period. If you have a question, please type it in the question box at any time. Please complete our brief survey for PDH credit. And at the conclusion of today's webinar, we will provide more information on how to get their certificate. Today's webinar is hosted by Robert Chapman, Hannah Schlachter, Scott Sertic, Chris Lant, and Pat Valentine. Robert Chapman is the Director of Product and Analytics at Contec. Rob has extensive experience in manufacturing, engineering, marketing, and product development. He has brought numerous products to market in various divisions within Contec using his unique and creative approach. Rob has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and technology from Purdue University and an MBA from Miami University Oxford School of Business. Now I'll turn it over to Rob to start the presentation. Thank you, Jill, and good afternoon, Stormwater community. Today we're going to showcase why Contec is not just a product company. We'll hear four stories showcasing the four product types we have for underground stormwater detention. But prior to that, we're going to review key components to consider when you are designing for underground detention. We'll highlight six key design considerations over the next few minutes. The first is gonna be that level of regulatory compliance and support that product has in the geography that you're designing within. Now, before spinning your wheels on a design, you're gonna to wanna to do some investigation and research into this area. Conduct does have a robust regulatory team that can offer help in the very beginning stages of your project. Now on the soil conditions, this is going to dictate the uses of solid systems or flexible systems, and there's great options in both. What about contaminated soils? What do you do when you encounter them? Do they need to be hauled off? Can you design around them? And then what about material costs? Often we get caught up comparing product X with product Y and focusing in on that. You're going to want to research the local cost of backfill excavation. It's highly suggested because this can greatly impact the cost of your project. The combination of these cost components can vary widely throughout the United States. Moving on to our final three, maintenance. Is the system going to be easy to inspect and maintain for the life of the design project for the owner? How intense and expensive is the maintenance process? Does the product's maintenance require special crews, expensive equipment? How long is it going to be uh, the maintenance events? Is it going to be frequent? Is there traffic in the area? These are all things to consider. Now, what about structural requirements? The systems needs to withstand not only the overlying soil loads, but also potentially heavy live loads and construction loading. What depth are you working with? Is there groundwater in the area? These components will not only dictate the size of the product you can select, but the material type as well. And what about durability, service life? The product and system need to be able to perform for the expected life in the design environment for your project. Underground product life cycles can range from 50 to 100, 125 years. Now let's talk best practice. This is a best practice in a way that many regulations throughout the country require pretreatment prior to underground storage. Pretreatment water quality devices prolong the life of underground storage systems and improve downstream water quality, protecting outlet controls. Pretreatment systems are going to remove sediment, floatables, and debris prior to storage. And what they're going to do, they're going to keep them in a central location that's easy to maintain. These treatment trains, pictured here, uh, are going to keep long-term costs low, protect the surrounding stone voids, and improve water quality for the community for the life of your project. So we're going to go into the design, and, or, sorry, just touching base on the available options for contact here. Sorry, flies are jumping around on me. There's two main product categories that contact's gonna offer. One is gonna be hydro hydrodynamic separation and filtration. And there's design considerations for these as well when you're looking at a treatment train. You're gonna wanna look at the footprint, soil conditions, 
local regulations, and then that level of flow in treatment that those regs are gonna require and or how it's been designed. So now finally on to the available product type. So picture top left, and we're gonna hear stories from each one of these. Picture top left is our chamber product. Top right, our steel reinforced HTPE Duramax product. Bottom left, Urban Pond, our precast system. And then bottom right is that product everybody knows, that aluminized type two corrugated metal pipe. So we're gonna switch it up a little bit. Um, as we lead into each of these stories, we're gonna showcase a fun or interesting fact. So sustainability and green steel is the focus of contact going forward. By 2026, the hope is that most infrastructure steel produced in the United States is using environmental friendly and sustainable methods. Cleveland Cliffs right up the road here from here in contact in Ohio had encouraging results using aspects of hydrogen in their production. And the hope is that over the long run, when you consider all aspects of production to finally getting to those steel coils and infrastructure steel, that we're using hydrogen, solar, wind, and hydropower to get to that final product. Now keep in mind that 95% of steel is recyclable, maintains its material properties, making it the most sustainable product on the market today. I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah. Hannah Schlachter is Contact Stormwater Area Director for the Northeastern United States. She has been with Contact for 12 years. She's worked in a number of roles in the organization, including product manager and stormwater design engineer. Hannah holds a bachelor's and a master's in civil engineering from the University of Toledo and is based out of Chicago, Illinois. So have at it, Hannah. Thanks, Rob. Today, I'm going to be sharing a project in the railroad capital of the US, which if you weren't aware, that is Chicago. And Chicago claimed this title because it's actually the only city in the United States to host all seven class one railroads, which are the big names like BNSF and CSX, Union Pacific. Chicago has been the country's busiest rail hub for 150 years and handles half of North America's train traffic. So given the amount of rail traffic in the Chicago metro area, there's a constant need for construction improvements to keep up with that volume. And one of the most recent projects that Contact was fortunate to be involved with was with BNSF for their Cicero yard improvements, which happened earlier this year. Cicero is a suburb located just a few miles west of downtown Chicago. The Cicero terminal is a very important facility for BNSF moving cargo to and from the Pacific Northwest. They have up to 145 trains per day coming through the facility. They began some construction improvements in 2022, and then they're continuing work through 2024. In the Chicago metro area, um, MWRD, which stands for Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, requires that sites detain flows from all disturbed acreage, even if it was already impervious. And this often results in large detention volume requirements, which was absolutely the case for this project. The original design utilized a concrete detention system to store 16 acre feet of stormwater. Now, most projects refer to detention volumes in cubic feet, so that would be equivalent to about 700,000 cubic feet of storage required. You can see on the site plan on the slide here that there was a pretty large footprint to work with on the site. And then the rectangle that you see, the red rectangle, is going to outline where the original concrete detention system was placed. Now, this site was a little bit unique in that it had contaminated soils. And if you've ever worked on a project with contaminated soils, you know how expensive it can be to haul them off site. So that meant that it was really important to keep the overall footprint of the system and the excavation to a minimum. When contact got involved, we evaluated all of our detention material options and quickly identified that corrugated metal pipe was the most economical solution for this project. There was a decent amount of depth to work with on the site, so we took advantage of that. We maximized the pipe diameter and used 90 inch diameter, 16 gauge CMP, which only needs 12 inches of cover. And then we also used our exfiltration joint, which is a specially designed joint to exfiltrate stormwater into the surrounding stone backfill. And that makes it possible to use the stone voids for storage along with the pipe storage and shrink the overall system footprint. Now it's not typical to use stone storage or stone voids for storage when contaminated, contaminated soils are on the site. Um, so we'd address that by working with a local pond liner company to line the entire excavation and then also work directly with the environmental team at BNSF to get that approved. There were a couple iterations of the design and a few changes in requirements that resulted in the final layout that you see on the image to the right. The red rectangle was the original concrete detention system footprint. And then you can see the 27 barrel CMP detention system footprint is a little bit larger, 
but that was mostly driven by the detention volume increasing from the original 16 acre feet to 17.25 acre feet. So that's roughly an 8% increase. Material and installation costs with CMP are much lower than concrete. So in the case of this project, even with the increased footprint, the cost of hauling the contaminated soils off site and the addition of the liner, it was still significantly less expensive to go with corrugated metal pipe than the original concrete design. Now on some projects, concrete detention is absolutely the ideal solution and you're gonna hear all about that with the next case study that Scott shares. So hold tight for that one. The blue angled line that you see represents a utility conflict that we learned about during the last design iteration. So we used a stair step design with staggered pipe lengths across the system to avoid that utility line. You can see that we had longer runs on the top of the system and then shorter runs on the bottom to avoid that. Corrugated metal pipe is the most versatile detention solution. There are so many ways to customize a CMP system and work within whatever footprint is available. And for this project, the layout was pretty simple. It was mostly rectangular, although we did have the staggered lengths. But keep in mind that we can do custom angles and elbows. We can work around any conflict that you might have on your site, whether that be a light pole in the middle of a parking lot, or if you need to wrap a system around the building, you'd be really surprised at what we can do with CMP. On this project, we fabricated inlet and outlet stubs, which are highlighted with the red rectangles, and then also 24 inch access risers for maintenance, which is highlighted with the red circles. And then while we didn't incorporate it on this project, um, we can and often do add great inlets on the risers. And then we even integrate outlet controls within the system by adding a fabricated weir and orifice. And taking advantage of these customizations can reduce your overall project cost. Contact redesigned the system four times with the image on the top left being the first iteration. This was when the storage volume was lower and we weren't aware of that utility conflict. And then the final design is shown in the bottom left. And for each iteration, we utilize the Contact Design Center, which is our online tool that fully automates the layout process for detention systems. This tool is completely free to use if you would like to do a detention layout on your own, or you can send it to the team at Contact. We'd be happy to optimize that for you. And the system is able to provide site-specific drawings, CAD files, 3D components, BIM models, and then stage storage calculations in a very short time frame since the tool makes it so efficient. We also have a dedicated team to make sure that installation goes smoothly. So we do pre-construction meetings, and we'll provide on-site support if necessary. And then of course, we have some very robust installation guides to make it easy for the contractor. So speaking of installation, here are some photos of the install. We started shipping pipe in late July and finished in early September. So it was a very quick installation given the size of the system. These pictures are from the start of the installation on the upstream manifold end of the system. And on the best day of install, the contractor was able to set 64 pieces of pipe, which if you were to lay those end to end, that's equivalent to over a quarter mile of pipe. I think it really demonstrates how fast CMP detention systems can go in the ground. This picture here does a great job showing the fabricated components like the inlet stub in the bottom, it's got the 24 inch access riser for maintenance that's near the top left. And then you can also get a good view of the pond liner that was used to address the contaminated soils. Contact has a nationwide manufacturing footprint for our corrugated metal pipe. For this project, we utilized our facility in Illinois, um, which is very close to the site. But if you're outside of the state of Illinois, you can see that map in the top left that shows our many manufacturing locations across the United States. And then here is the system almost completely installed. You can see downtown Chicago in the background there. And just a few key takeaways from this project. Um, first and foremost is that CMP detention is an economical solution, often the most economical solution to meet underground detention needs. It's very easy to customize. It allows for integrated components like access risers for maintenance, outlet controls. Um, CMP can be installed very quickly as we demonstrated with this case study and context nationwide manufacturing footprint reduces freight and lead <clears> time, <throat> or loss and lead time. Um, lastly, if you have a project with contaminated soils, consider using a pond liner. That can definitely expand your detention material choices and then lower your overall project costs. So that concludes the uh, CMP detention portion. I'm going to kick it back to Rob and then let him introduce our next presenter. Awesome. Thank you, Hannah. So we're going to move on to our urban pond product. But before that, concrete has withstood the test of time. It's been used in infrastructure for over 8,000 years. There's still aspects of concrete infrastructure located in the Middle East this very day, dating back 6,500 years ago in the form of concrete floors, 
housing structures, and even underground cisterns. I'm gonna flip it over to Scott. Uh, Scott Servich is our Western Stormwater Manager, Colorado native who loves skiing, collecting concert posters. He has 19 years, almost two decades of civil engineering experience. He's designed everything from houses to highways and recently emphasis on stormwater storage and treatment. So I will pass it to Scott. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Rob. Today, I'm gonna to talk about urban pond for dense urban retrofit. <clears throat> the case study here is the Point Loma hillside development in San Diego, California. Regulatory requirements for this project included stormwater storage, stormwater treatment, and infiltration to recharge the groundwater table below. <clears throat> Site challenges included no open space, which was particularly difficult because they also required on-site stormwater storage and treatment. The largest design challenge was that we only had a narrow corridor for storage between the building and the utilities. This site had a storage and treatment volume requirement of 2,681 cubic feet. Now, that may not seem like a lot, um, but it does go to show that no matter how large or how small your project is, Contech has solutions. Point Loma Peninsula, California, is an iconic land feature that jets out into the Pacific Ocean and completes the northern rim of the San Diego Bay. The peninsula has been described as where California began, marking the first landing point for European expeditions to present day California. This moniker is especially fitting as Point Loma has now become a landing place for Urban Pond. Urban Pond is a highly configurable stormwater storage system that is providing owners, owners contractors, and engineers access to superior underground capabilities. Within this historical area, as with many other urban retrofits, every possible square foot is sought after and maximized. Development opportunities or replacement projects in Point Loma are rare due to existing developments and topographical challenges. Site redevelopment in this trendy area of steep hillsides and urban density require that the new construction be even more efficient and more creative with land usage in order to maximize opportunities. The extreme challenges of the topography require innovative solutions from architects and engineers. The existing site, <clears throat> as you see here, is a triangular piece of land crisscrossed with utilities that is almost completely developed with storefronts and parking, leaving no open space for stormwater BMPs. Local regulations require on-site stormwater storage and treatment, and any means of infiltrating stormwater back into the groundwater aquifer is also highly encouraged. While collaborating with the engineer of record, we determined the only available space for stormwater storage and treatment was a slim corridor between the building footings and utilities. And it just so happened to be a perfect fit for Urban Pond. The Point Loma Hillside development consists of replacing an existing commercial building and asphalt parking lot with a state-of-the-art multi-use complex. It includes apartment dwellings, street-side retail space, and underground parking. The redesign increases the site's imperviousness, which of course leads to additional trash, debris, and total suspended solids in the stormwater runoff. Now, redeveloping this parcel with traditional ground level BMPs would require a substantial usage of the available, of the available lot at the site's low elevation point. The outlines on screen illustrate approximate areas required for the stormwater storage in blue and biofiltration in green. Again, it may not look like much, but BMPs in these areas would make building construction, drive aisles, and parking unavailable. They would also completely inhibit access to and from the site. Removing so much area from the redevelopment would, would lead to loss of access and reduced development and make the project infeasible and unprofitable. Thankfully, contact comes with solutions. To solve both the storage and treatment needs, we applied a treatment train of proven and compatible systems that address multiple site challenges. The urban pond system provides storage for all of the site's collective stormwater runoff. The modules are five foot inside height to fit snugly beneath the building's parking structure while avoiding utilities and withstanding the HS20 vehicular loading. The modules are placed on a concrete foundation slab with multiple uh, infiltration holes that allow water to recharge the groundwater table below. 
A downstream underground modular wetland system provides on-site treatment and completes the treatment train. The lot is now 100% usable. The stormwater BMPs are discreetly out of sight, yet still easily accessible for annual maintenance and inspections. And the developer can maximize the return on their investment. Here are some site photos. On the left, you can see the narrow corridor that the urban pond modules fit into. Important details include the nearly vertical walls in the excavation pit, the infiltration openings on the floor of the base slab, and the manhole, manhole access directly above. On the right, you can see the nearly completed system with all walls and joint tape in place. It's now ready for backfill. This system was installed in one day. As I mentioned earlier, Urban Pond is highly configurable. Modules are available in mono and stacked configurations, ranging from three foot to 14 foot inside height and six inch height increments. To summarize, this project had many challenges. Uh, it includes urban redevelopment, a small footprint, no open space, infiltration, building footings, and existing utilities as well as the requirements for on-site on -site stormwater storage and treatment. <clears throat> the solutions, of course, as I mentioned before, were urban pond installed underground with no loss of valuable real estate, infiltration openings seamlessly incorporated into the design, and precast concrete to easily manage the HS20 loading while fitting that narrow corridor of availability. Together, the urban pond storage and the modular wetlands biofiltration system provide a treatment train for all of the site's stormwater needs. So key takeaways for urban pond is strength. Concrete is strong and it's great for under parking areas. It can also be rapidly installed. Uh, when sites have limited availability, deliveries can be staged and it can be typically backfilled with native soils. This saves one more expense one more thing that the contractor has to negotiate or plan ahead about. <clears throat> and as mentioned earlier, it has infinite configurations with variable heights and multiple shapes to fit unique site footprints. Thanks for your time. I'll turn it back to Rob now. Thank you, Scott. So let's talk shipping efficiency before we head into our Chamber Max products. So one truckload of our Chamber product contains 11 pallets 27 chambers on each product or each pallet rather and what we're getting is about the equivalent of a small commercial project in terms of storage with just over 22,000 cubic foot of storage using those chambers on one truck now i'm going to pass it over to chris chris is probably one of the most passionate individuals about the environment diver a stormwater consultant and regulatory manager in the southeast region two and a half decades of experience using designs permits, experience across the United States and Canada. He's applied new treatment technologies for civil engineering design. He studied construction management and environmental engineering at the University of Florida. His background in construction management and engineering consulting prior to contact allows his focus on stormwater. He brings a diverse perspective to the industry. So I'll pass it over to Chris now. Thank you for the introduction. So as uh, Rob outlined, I'm gonna be going over context plastic chamber product called Chamber Max. Uh, many of the engineers I work with don't even always remember that we have a plastic chamber option. Usually that's because we can create a more cost effective and space effective design using CMP. But it's an important part of the toolbox that we can offer. Having more diverse options allows us to optimize each portion of your site with the product that is best for that particular need. So the Chamber Max product is a 30 inch tall chamber. It provides 78 cubic feet of storage per chamber. That works out to about 2.3 cubic feet of storage per square foot of plan view surface area. And we can utilize rows of Chamber Max as pretreatment mechanisms to clean the stormwater before the water goes into the infiltration rows. We call those containment rows. So our typical layout for Chamber Max is going to have a manifolded connection on at least one side that allows us to produce rapid ingress of stormwater during a storm event. On the upstream of those manifold connections is where we would locate a containment row. And they're going to be put into place in conjunction with a diversion manhole that has a weir in it that diverts the first flush flows from your drainage basin into that chamber row. 
after that chamber row fills up, the excess flows will jump that weir and go out to the infiltration areas of the design. And looking at that in cross section, our typical standard installation is gonna use a six inch layer of bedstone, a six inch layer of cover stone. The chamber is 30 inches tall. So we've got a total vertical cross section for most installations of 42 inches that we can store water within. And these chambers require 18 inches of cover to sustain HS20, HS25 traffic loading. And this is a photo of an installation going in. So typical installation, you can see the bedstone, you can see the cover stone. The nearest chamber row here has the liner in it that's gonna create that containment row. And basically you're creating a settling chamber on the upstream side of the layout that's gonna collect sediments and keep those sediments up out of the bedstone, which is gonna allow the void space of the bedstone to stay there. It's gonna not limit the infiltration rate and it's gonna contain those sediments in a location that can be cleaned out uh, during a maintenance event. So I said earlier that this is an important tool that we have to utilize for making the most optimum design possible. And I've got a good example of that in a Central Florida project that we're just finishing up this year uh, called Registry at Grass Lake. Registry at Grass Lake is a large multifamily apartment complex. And like most designs in Florida, we have a water quality volume and storm attenuation uh, storage component to the design. We used a 50 inch optimized CMP design to store 1.6 acre feet uh, for that part of this project. Absolutely the most cost effective and space efficient solution that we could have offered for this part of the project. On another part of the storage requirements, however, we needed to do something called compensated storage volume designs. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, uh, what compensating storage is referring to is if a site infiltrates or doesn't infiltrate it, if it encroaches upon a floodplain, you have to replace the lost volume from that floodplain somewhere on your site. And we chose to do that with multiple uh, rectangles of chamber max. So this green oval shape represents the approximate area of the encroachment on the floodplain. We needed to remove or replace all of that volume with these individual layouts of chamber max. So that upper left corner layout for the chambers looked like this, and that is a photo of it going into the ground. And we used chamber max on this part of the project for a very particular reason. If you've ever had a contact representative come into your office, you're familiar with the design criteria that we're gonna ask you about. We're always interested in knowing the total volume that we need to store on your site. Uh, we need to know where your footprint locations are that you could put that volume. We're interested in the storage depth that's available, which is usually a dimension between the water table and your finished grade. We wanna know if we're doing a retention design that's designed to infiltrate the water into the ground or if we're designing a detention system that's gonna release the flow through a drawdown orifice. We look at your paving and grading plan to determine how much cover that we've got to make sure that we can maintain highway traffic loading. And we look at maintenance and pretreatment requirements, especially from a permitting perspective. Um, the design criteria that's most critical here is the storage depth that you have available to you. That determines everything about the design. It's cost efficiency, um, how much footprint we're gonna have, can we fit all the volume in on your site? And this is especially true for compensating storage designs. So compensating storage designs are limited to the floodplain elevations that you infill. So however your site encroached into the floodplain, whatever elevations the, that encroachment filled up, you have to replace the storage at those same elevations. So a typical floodplain is gonna have a base elevation and it's gonna have a peak elevation in Florida, most often that peak elevation is associated with a 100 year floodplain. So where these two elevations were in this particular project is where we needed to replace storage. And this is where Chamber Max came into particular use on this project. Because of the shape of chambers, the parabolic shape, we could replace more storage at lower elevations more quickly with a chamber design than we could with a round pipe design. So while we could have overall provided more storage and a tighter footprint, 
if we were doing the typical water quality volume in this part of the site, we were limited to replacing the, that storage volume between these elevations. And so Chamber Max fit the bill perfectly. We could do a better cost efficient design for this particular set of circumstances with the chamber. So we don't try to use one particular product to fit all needs on a site. We can mix and match our product solutions and use their diversity to the advantage of each site. So this project was a perfect example of that. We used an optimized CMP design for the water quality volume and peak attenuation volume. And then we were able to take advantage of that chamber shape to replace the encroached upon floodplain with volumes that were within the elevations that we needed to permit with. And with that, I'm done. Thank you for your time. Great, thanks, Chris. So we're gonna move on to Duramax with Pat, a hybrid product of steel and plastic HDPE, but another did you know for everybody. So we're gonna talk 120 inch Duramax, 10 foot in diameter, and just compare some weights here. So on the left, is at 120 inch Duramax weighing in at 109 pounds per foot. And then again, focusing on the handling aspect, ease of install, we'll look at a concrete pipe, 129 pounds per foot on 15 inches. So considerably less size. And if you wanna reach uh, the equivalent of 24 inch, we're looking at ductile iron, still weighing more at 119 pounds per foot. So I'm gonna turn it over to Pat Valentine, a professional engineer, stormwater consultant, in Southern Virginia, he has a decade experience in manufactured stormwater treatment and detention systems with contact. Again, a PE registered in the state of Maryland, bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering from Tech. So take it away, Pat. All right, thank you, Rob, and hello, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a project that we worked on in uh, Southwestern Virginia. Um, so this project was a new state DOT facility located in Clintwood, Virginia. Um, and the engineer asked us to provide a solution to their underground storage facility um, to meet the needs for the site. Uh, to make things interesting, this site proposed or posed a few unique challenges. Uh, for the first one being that we needed to store 43,000 cubic feet of storage within a roughly 11,000 square foot footprint which when you crunch the numbers, that's a pretty large storage volume for a relatively small footprint. Um, the second challenge was that the site was being used to store calcium chloride, road salt, and other de-icing agents. So the stormwater runoff that was going to be stored in the detention system was going to have a high concentration of salt. Um, so we needed to deal with a highly corrosive environment um, for detention. And lastly, the specifications called for a welded joint or a similar design for the detention system. So essentially we needed a large diameter, corrosive resistant pipe with a welded joint coupler. Um, so when you're faced with a project like this with a lot of challenges, um, it's pretty easy to start scratching off potential options. Um, so first we're not going to recommend aluminized uh, CMP in a very highly corrosive environment like this. Um, we didn't really explore polymer coated CMP, but again, CMP can't be watertight. Um, so that was not an option. Next, HDPE is not available in diameters above 60 inches. Um, so the, the engineer would not be able to store their required storage within the footprint using HDPE. Um, concrete, may have worked for this project, um, but it's not very easy to make concrete watertight. And as Rob alluded to in his uh, fun fact slide, there may be a, a more lightweight option available. Um, so we kept looking on this project. So for this project, we ended up using a solution called Duramax. Um, Duramax is a steel reinforced polyethylene pipe or SRPE. Essentially, it combines the durability of polyethylene with the strength of steel. Um, so it's resistant to corrosion. And because of the steel reinforcing, uh, we can make it in diameters up to 120 inches. Um, it also has a few different joint options. So there is a simple banded joint for a soil tight connection. 
Um, we also have either a bell and spigot or a welded coupler joint to uh, for a more watertight connection. So we were able to meet all three challenges on this site um, with Duramax. So we had the resistant to corrosion, large diameter pipe, and then the welded connection that was required. So just to get a better idea uh, or learn a little bit, little bit more about Duramax pipe, um, I have a couple pictures here to kind of show a closer look at what the pipe looks like. Um, as you can see, it's predominantly a polyethylene pipe with uh, steel ribbings around the exterior of the pipe for reinforcing. Uh, the picture on the right shows a, a cut section of a piece of wall of the pipe. Um, so you can see how the ribs rib reinforcing fits in. You can see that the ribs are fully surrounded by polyethylene, uh, so the steel is not exposed to the environment. Um, it's also, the ribs are on the outside, so it is a smooth interior pipe, so you can use it for drainage applications, sanitary applications, um, and it has a Manning's N uh, roughly between 0 0.011 and 0 0.013. So for this uh, VDOT project, uh, we ended up supplying 876 linear feet of 96 inch diameter Duramax pipe to store the 43,000 cubic feet required. Um, the system was laid out in six parallel runs with uh, two 30 inch header pipes or manifold pipes on both sides to, uh, to connect the, the six runs. Um, each run also had two 36 inch risers for manual access to get into the system for inspection and maintenance. Um, so here's on this slide, I have uh, our shop drawing, which shows the layout of the system. And then on this next slide, you can see the actual system, some pictures um, that were taken during the installation um, in the summer of 2021. Um, so you can see the, the six runs of pipe here, the manifolds on both sides, the 36 inch risers um, to accommodate access, um, one note, uh, the metal bands that you see in these pictures, those are just to hold the pipe in place during installation. Um, so after all the pipes were installed, a company that we work with called Plastic Works, um, they actually went into the pipe and welded all those joints um, together to create that welded connection that was required for this project. So what are some of the advantages of using Duramax pipe? So first it's available nationally um, and it's available in diameters from 30 inches through 120 inches. So it can fit on most sites. Um, it's a very lightweight solution. So it's easy to handle, easy to install. Uh, we have the three joint options that I mentioned. So there's the welded joint. There is a high performance bell and spigot joint. And then there's a soil tight joint. Um, again, you have the advantages of the steel reinforcing, which make the pipe twice as stiff as HDPE. So you don't have creep or buckling <clears throat> that, that you would have with uh, traditional HDPE. You also don't have changes in strength or stiffness due to high temperatures that you would with HDPE. Um, so for example, this, this project that I talked about that installed in the summer, um, we didn't have um, heat kind of impacting the, the stiffness of that pipe during installation. Um, and lastly, we have uh, access risers that can uh, that create access to the system. Um, either 30 inch, 36 inch risers can easily be um, accommodated by this pipe. And really, I mean, as, as uh, Rob mentioned at the beginning, access into any buried detention system is very important. So uh, it's another crucial benefit of using Duramax. So what are the actual, what are some applications for Duramax pipe? You know, as we illustrated with this project example, Duramax is a great solution in a corrosive stormwater detention environment, especially if you need a large diameter pipe. Um, but because of all of its advantages, there are, there are really a lot of uses for Duramax. Um, it's a great solution for sanitary or CSO applications. We make a lot of cisterns for rainwater harvesting using uh, using Duramax. We've used it on irrigation projects, reline applications. Uh, we used it for glycol storage at airports, uh, AFFF and other hazardous containment. 
Uh, recently, I used it for a, an oil spill project in uh, or potential oil spill uh, safety feature on another project here in Virginia. Um, so we can use it for a, a lot of different applications. Um, Duramax is definitely more of a niche product. So if you just have a standard uh, detention system, I would definitely recommend starting with CMP or corrugated metal pipe. That's definitely going to be the more economical solution. But if you have a project that that it's similar to this uh, VDOT project that I talked about today, or it fits one of the categories on this slide, I would rec recommend reaching out to uh, your local contact representative, and I'm sure we can find a solution for you using Duramax. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Rob to uh, wrap things up and take some questions. Thank you all. All right, thanks, Pat, and thanks for the, the Duramax project example. So we're gonna wrap it up soon. And what I wanna do is just encourage everybody to consider the option. So we're not just a single product company. You see the four pictured up at the top there. We offer the best design support, I believe in the industry, and we can do that either in person or through virtual collaboration. We have some great tools to do that. I'll touch base in a second here. So. The number of things that we've encountered today, we've needed lightweight materials, we've had low cover, 100 year plus service life, corrosive environments, high water tables, pours. there's a number of stuff that we can work with you to make sure you get what your project needs. And then finally, there's gonna be three ways to, uh, to get started. More traditional ways, contact your local representative. You can do that through the website or giving us a, a phone call. You can fill out what we call PDW and or find the project design uh, worksheet and just putting basic criteria in to help us get started. And then my personal favorite, baby of mine, the Contact Design Center. And that allows you to create a project layout um, using traditional CAD methods, get 3D BIM models, project layouts, stage storage. So there's a number of professional deliverables uh, that you could use in that system. We use it all the time via Teams and Zoom meetings. We navigate around utilities it is an excellent program to just not only get your design started, but get everyone on the same page when you are encountering issues. Everybody gets updated designs almost instantly once the, the projects work through. So I'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you, everybody. And I'll get it back to Jill. And I think she'll give you the whole PDH spill. And uh, I'm done. Thank you. Got some technical issues back in uh, Westchester. Can you hear me, guys? Yep, we got you, Joe. Go ahead with the question. Oh, PDH. Sorry, yeah, there was the internet's going out. Okay, so the first question is: Which option has the highest percentage of open volume? Maybe some more clarity for the, the team, Jill, in terms of open volume, in terms um, of open material space, or? Um, I'll pick a different question. What is the minimum yeah, cover for the Duramax under a parking lot or road pavement? Oh, I can take that. Um, so that's going to depend on the diameter um, that you have. For the project I talked about, 96 inch, that's going to need uh, two feet of cover um, to the bottom of asphalt for, uh, for HS 20 loading. Um, some of the smaller diameter pipes, it's going to be one feet, one feet or one foot of cover, uh, through 60 inch. And then, uh, up at 120 inches, there's uh three feet of cover required. Thank you. Our next question is, do we provide arch pipe in CMP? Take that one. Um, yes, we do have options for arch pipe with CMP. I will say that it isn't used within de detention applications as much as culvert applications, but it is something that we can evaluate and look at for project specific needs. Thank you, Hannah. What is the expected life of CMP?
for me to grab that? So it, it's going to vary depending on the material type. We have uh, uh, four main material types. Uh, we could do brackish waters with our aluminum uh, detention systems. We've got aluminized type two. That's roughly 90% plus of what's going in the ground for corrugated metal pipe. And then if you're looking for those 100-year service lives, we do have that polymer-coated uh, poly detention system that we could do that's got that coating on it as well. And we do offer various thicknesses too if you want to work within those materials. Thank you, Robin. What are the maintenance requirements for CMP? I did that one. Um, so maintenance requirements for corrugated metal pipe detention systems, we would recommend that it's inspected annually. And then our recommendation is that it's cleaned when you see that there is sediment or trash that's clogging the outlet orifice. And usually the accumulated material can be evacuated through the access riser that is located right over the outlet orifice. And then we often provide risers at the inlets as well, um, just to create ease of getting around the system and anywhere that we think that material might have more likely chance of accumulating. Um, but our CMP detention systems with the access risers, it, there's the ability to get inside of them and actually maintain all of the different pipe, pipe runs if necessary. But most of the time the sediment is accumulated, the inlet and the outlets. Thank you, Hannah. What solutions do you have available for airport crash rated underground detention? Was that crash rated? <laughs> Aircraft? <laughs> Aircraft. Oh. <Wow>. Um, <laughs> um, I, I know we've used, uh, so we have a bridge product called Conspan that we've used on um, some airport projects that had uh, aircraft loading requirements. Um, I know we did that uh, airport in Rhode Island. Um, that's a, a project example there. Um, I don't know if any of these other systems can necessarily be aircraft loaded. I mean, depending on the size of the plane. I think theoretically, most of them could. You know, there's so many considerations. I've worked on several airport and port projects. The depth of cover makes a difference because that distributes the load. But in my experience on airport projects, usually the reinforcement and the cross section, if you will, of the pavement itself, the tarmac, is what carries most of the load. So I think depending on the circumstance, almost all of these could be used, um, although we might uh, err on the side of moving toward things like bridge products in those types of applications. Yeah, we have a lot of information. If you go to contactes.com slash airfields or air, airports, there's a lot of airfield case studies with what the team's talking about. Uh, some great content that we focused with a lot of the grants that have been released recently. Yes, we do. Our next question is, what is the recommended minimum cover over the chamber max under parking or road pavement? Yeah, so the minimum cover is 18 inches from the top of the chamber to the base of the asphalt uh, course in your pavement section, which I usually assume to be two inches. So that would be a total of 20 inches. If it's concrete pavement, that 18 inch dimension is from the top of the chamber to the top of the pavement. So two inches less than you would for asphalt uh, if you're using a concrete pavement section. For the concrete detention system, would it be a concern for the bottom of the tank to be below the groundwater? Will this lead to I and I problems in the future? I'll take that one. Um, we'd wanna look at the site specifics, You know, really take a look at uh, what the groundwater conditions are like what kind of variables we're playing with. Um, concrete could be a good solution, um, but like these other examples, um, there may be other products that are a better fit. Does contact provide any installation support when these systems are installed? I can take that one, I guess. Um, yes, so Contact has a team of sales engineers that are spread all across the country and oftentimes you'll find them at job sites assisting contractors. And then we also have field consultants that will send out if a project is um, you know, extra complicated, which doesn't happen too often, but we make sure that the contractor has the support necessary to make sure that it goes into the ground correctly.
Our next question is, what is the recommended backfill around the CMP system? You want to take that one, Rob? Yeah, there's a, we have our standard guidance that's going to output with that DYO software that we uh, have mentioned numerous times throughout. Um, it's going to depend if you're going with a solid system that's containing all the, the stormwater in that um, and the rock that's going to be local to your geography. And we help call that out when you're designing. And then we also have different rock characteristics that we'll recommend uh, for exfiltration, pro exfiltration projects and or perforated systems uh, to make sure everything's performing as expected. And it's standard call outs, A1, A2. Um, we're going to map them to each system and give you best recommendations. And then the sales engineers uh, that have spoken about they're going to help equivalent those rock callouts to maybe what it's called at the local quarry to help everybody out with the project. Thank you, Rob. Does the Duramax come with perforations for infiltration? Um, it can. Um, it's uh, yeah, we have we have done that before. Um, it's it's going to be kind of hand perforated and there's a, a bit of a cost associated with that. I'm mean, a small cost adder associated with that, but yes, we can do that. Do you install steps into the large diameter pipe for access and maintenance purposes? We can, yes. Uh, we've done uh, coated ladders in order to, to get down in there. Uh, we designed for portable ladders to be able to climb down in there. Um, we just want to make sure that we're finding local guidance, OSHA stuff, everybody's getting in there safe. Climbing into these things can be dangerous. So um, just reach out if you got specific questions. But more often than not, we're putting our access risers in an area that makes sense so someone can safely climb down into that using a, one of the two methods. How important is soil pH for the metal products? I can go ahead and take that. Um, it's definitely an important factor when we're identifying which material we want to use on a project. And so we follow the guidance in our um, design guide, which you can actually find on Context website if you'd like to look through that. So there's a couple different ranges that we look at, and then we will pinpoint the appropriate material based on that information. Um, the number one issue I have always experienced is the ability to clean the stormwater system. Uh, I understand how to clean the corrugated pipe, but how do you clean the concrete and plastic systems? Right. I'll take the concrete question. Um, mm. There's lots of different ways to do that. Uh, typically, we recommend annual inspections and maintenance just to see what the sediment load is. Um, if you provide an upstream device as part of a treatment train, that's also a great way to remove the pollutants before they get into any of the detention systems. Um, but then if there is anything accumulated in there, um, which typically happens, uh, it's always easy to remove them with uh, you know, either a power washer or sometimes just a shovel. Um, again, depending on the site, uh, there's different methods that, that work better, uh, as well as the size of the system. Uh, but in all cases, we try to make maintenance accessible try to make it uh, intelligent uh, for people to get down in there and, uh, and do it safely and effectively. And regarding cleaning out a, a chamber system, it's very similar to a CMP storage system in that the vacuum truck is gonna go out and access the system through a, a typical manhole type structure. And they're gonna put the reverse jet hose down into that access and it's gonna run up that row of pipe or run of chambers it's going to push all the sediments back to the access and they'll vacuum out the sediments that get pushed back into that location. So very similar between uh, a CMP storage system and a chamber max storage system. Yeah, well, I guess with, with Duramax as well, I mean, so Duramax, CMP and concrete are all very easy. You can get into the system. If it's a large enough diameter pipe, um, you don't have to use a reverse jet nozzle and try to deal with all that. Um, but that's, you can get into the system and, and clean just the same way you would CMP. I see a lot of uh, questions regarding the same topic of where the access risers are and making sure the whole system can be inspected. The standard design that, that contact leads and really 
pretty much everybody in the industry is going to be a, a manifold design where we're connecting those lines with a manifold um, 60 inches, even with a large diameter. So somebody can get through the other lines that wouldn't have a, a traditional access riser uh, to climb down into. And for the Urban Pond product, what is the typical required cover? Typical minimum cover for Urban Pond is one foot. And maximum cover can be site specific. Uh, again, it, it sometimes varies by module height. Uh, I've seen five foot is a typical range, eight foot is a typical maximum. Give me a minute. There's just so many questions coming in. <laughs> what is the minimum horizontal separation between the Duramax pipes? Um, so that's going to again depend on diameter. Um, so that'll that'll be typically. I think it's about the same as uh, as CMP, where it's. Uh, half the diameter up to uh, up to 60 inches or up to 72 inches rather. And then up above that, it's uh, three inches between spacing or three inches between barrels is what we typically recommend. And that's just so you can get the uh, properly backfill it and get the, the stone backfilling un under the under the pipe. Three feet below between barrels. Uh, yeah, up uh, 72 inch up through uh, 120, yeah. Are chamber max systems available in New Jersey? They, they are available yeah. everywhere in the country. Um, we make them I, and supply them out of Ohio, I think. So um, they'd just be coming from Ohio, but yes, they're available. Trying to find one last question. Oh, there's just too many. So I guess we'll just end our presentation here. So thank you, Rob, Hannah, Pat, Chris, and Scott for presenting today. And thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. If your question was not answered, a contact representative will reach out to you with a response. A survey will appear once we conclude the webinar. Please complete the short survey to receive your PDH credit. A follow-up email will be sent by the end of the day. That will include a link with instructions on how to download your PDH certificate. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hannah, Chris, Pat, Scott. Thank you.